My name is Richard Holliman. I'm the Open University Champion for Public Engagement with Research. I'm also, well, as part of that role, I'm Principal Investigator on a project called SUPI, which is our school's university partnership initiative, and our project is called <coughs> Engaging Opportunities. And uh, my name is Gareth Davis. I'm the evaluation researcher on the uh, Engaging Opportunities project and also the Per Catalyst project. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background about who I am quickly before Richard talks through the first few slides. So I carried out a PhD at Cranfield University in decision science. Uh, what I actually did was develop a decision support tool to increase the transparency that personal and organisational features have on governments, on the confidence the government place in different lines of evidence. So these were like risk-based decisions, so lines of evidence are coming up through government departments and organisations to, to central government and I was trying to show how personal and organisational features influence that. So as I've said my role here is as the engaging um, evaluation researcher, I think I might have said engaging researcher, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll hand over to Rick now for the first few slides. Okay. Okay. Does this work? Okay, so, uh, so the work we're doing on this Engaging Opportunities project, which is funded by RCUK, ties into this uh, concord work for engaging the public research. Uh, for everybody in the room, they'll be pretty familiar with this because we've talked about it a lot in terms of the public engagement research catalyst. Um, crucially, it also applies to school university engagement. So part of what we have to do on this project is to raise a raise the profile of this kind of work across the university. So some kind of strategic commitment, not just to public engagement, but specifically in this case to school university engagement is part of what we're trying to do. That's part of the requirements of the project. Um, crucially, see how researchers are recognised and valued for their work. In this case, in school university engagement, is a slightly different focus for more broadly engaged research. Um, and then to provide training, support and opportunities for, for researchers to actually do this kind of work. Finally, part of what we're trying to do is to ensure that we have regular reviews. Um, and part of that comes down to things like REF, Research uh, Excellence Framework. Uh, but it all come, also comes down to more personal, regular reviews, such as CDSAs, Career Development Staff Appraisal Annual Reviews, basically, for researchers. So in a sense, a lot of what we're trying to do in the Public Engagement Catalyst, which is kind of a broad kind of brush across all kind of open university research, focuses down a very specific way on this project to school university engagement. And for me, sitting across the two projects, it raises a whole series of challenges which I don't have necessarily on the Public Engagement Research Catalyst, although that's not without its challenges, as we know. But in this case, it's a very specific set of challenges because typically researchers have done this kind of work. They like working with schools. Um, they particularly like to work with school children because they are people who might go on to become researchers. Um, that's typically a kind of particular kind of argument that's made for this kind of work. And in our our case, what we're trying to do is take that forwards a little bit further and to say, okay, if researchers are doing this, but they're doing it in their spare time, how can we move that to a firmer footing to make it more um, a core part of the research activity? And crucially, it does come down to the kind of value associated with this kind of work. So in a strategic sense, if we don't value this kind of work, why are we doing it? So how can we ensure that it is a more valued activity? So that's basically what we're trying to do. So we were funded to do this by RCUK, so you know, a high profile project in that respect, uh, over three years, and there were 12 projects across the UK. And in pretty much every case, not in every case actually, there's at least one I can think that isn't working with the Teaching School Alliance, what universities were asked to do was work with schools in their local area, particularly through these Teaching School Alliances. So Teaching School in a particular area is an outstanding school and creates this kind of network of schools around it and diffuses its expertise and its excellence to these other schools. That's generally the kind of model, yeah? So in our case, we're working with the Denby Teaching School Alliance in Milton Keynes. So we're working with 12 schools across Milton Keynes. So the requirements were quite straightforward in some respects, but quite challenging in terms of the amount of money that was put on the table. So we were asked to do a st provide strategic and structured mechanisms for school university engagement. 
So that obviously ties back into the point I was making before. So how can we put this on a more strategic footing across the university? So rather than just saying, okay, we'll go and do one, into, you know, one activity on a weekend or on a, after school with a group of school children, how do we do it in a more structured way to say, okay, let's build a partnership across schools in Milton Keynes? So as a kind of simpler example to that, I get contacted by lots of researchers, some of whom are in KMI, a few KMI researchers here, some of whom are in Institute of Education Technology, some of whom are in Computing, and they'll have typically developed some kind of system to promote learning in, in a school and context, and what they want me to do is provide somebody to test that kind of system. So how can we do that in a more structured way so that actually we have opportunities for, for researchers to go into schools, um, which isn't just kind of ad hoc, it was very much about direct engagement, um, which in terms of uh, RCUK language meant they wanted researchers sitting in the same room as the students. Okay, so when we first discussed this at, at, kind of at the level of the OU about how we were going to organise this, typically um, the answer was, well, let's do a national project um, and let's do it in a kind of way that's mediated by technology. So the researchers wouldn't necessarily be sitting in the same room as the students. RCUK weren't that keen on that idea. So it was very much about, okay, how can we get researchers in the same room as the students? Crucially, at the bottom here, which comes back to that point about recognising and valuing excellence in this kind of area um, and regular reviews, they wanted the whole project to be evaluated. So one of the things that really struck me about working on the proposal for this project was that it was a, a very, very small literature on school university engagement. People typically haven't written this stuff up which when you think about the amount of activity that's going on, seems quite extraordinary. So typically people do this kind of stuff, but they don't evaluate it, or if they evaluate it, they certainly don't write it up into the literature. So there was a big gap there. So part of what we're trying to do, and partly what we're trying to work with Gareth for, is to actually start to do that, so try to, to build a literature around this kind of area. And if you've got 12 projects across the UK all doing the same sort of thing, then hopefully you start to build a bit of a kind of momentum around it. And that's all about raising the value, I think, of this kind of area, uh, area of working. And the other one, which we talked a little bit about the meeting we've just come from, um, is about this notion of shared funding. So to move to a kind of situation where you're putting a project proposal together, where you want to work in collaboration with a, an institution or an organisation, but actually saying what we'll do is we'll try and split the money between us. So the university gets a certain proportion, but the partners that you're working with outside the university gets a certain proportion. So it was a requirement that we would do that. That was actually written into the, to the call for proposals. There was a significant proportion of the money had to go to an external organisation, as in a school. So we had to build that in from the start. You can imagine how popular that was when I put that through finance. But. So we get the money, um, and we get the money based on these aims and objectives, OK? So typically, this notion of inspiring young people to take a career in research is, is back to that kind of typical kind of argument that's made for doing this kind of work in the first place. But what we tried to do is kind of be a bit more holistic about it. So we're interested in just raising awareness around different types of academic research. So we're working right across the university. So you can start to talk to students about what a philosopher does when they research or an art historian and compare that to an educational technologist or a, a scientist or a stem cell researcher, yeah? Um, promote different roles of successful researchers and what that might look like. And then, crucially, the one that was, if you like, most, most interesting to me personally was this kind of generating awareness of the nature and challenges of contemporary research. So there's always been, my background is in science communication, science engagement, and there was always this tension in all the work I've done for sort of like 15, 20 years around what research means in the public sphere. So typically people are concerned when they're given a successful project, well, how did that come to be? Why wasn't I given an opportunity to comment on it? Um, what happens when things go wrong? And what is the nature of the kind of challenges around that? So that kind of big picture about raising the, uh, generating some kind of awareness about what research actually is, is kind of crucial to the project. So when we met as our 12 projects back down in London for the first time, one of the most interesting conversations we had, which was led by a teacher uh, from a school in London was, how do you teach somebody about the nature of research when they're 11? It was a brilliant conversation, you know, just about what the nature of research is. That was fascinating. So we have a little team here. For me, uh, 
two most important people here are Andy Squires and Mark Russell, who are both based at the school. Uh, Helen Brown's not actually on this picture, but you know we've got two or three people we work with really consistently on the project, uh, and that kind of co collaboration between us and the schools is kind of crucial. So, one of the things we've done on the public engagement research catalyst, which kind of tallies across to this one um, on SUPI, is to think about what engaged research might be. What is it? What does the definition of uh, engaged research look like? And this is something we took to research committee a couple of weeks ago and we had approved um, as a kind of definition of engaged research across the Open University. And the interesting thing for me when we were sitting down, Gareth and I just chatting about what we're going to talk about today, was to think about this engaged research definition and how it might apply in a school's context. So what we've tried to do here is write it in a way that covers all types of research engagement across all academic disciplines. But then obviously you need to make sure that it applies in specific contexts and is meaningful in specific contexts. So if we think about our stakeholders, typically our primary stakeholders are obviously students at key stages three, four and five. So anybody from 11 to 19, roughly speaking. Uh, although we've worked for a few students who are a little bit older than that. Teachers obviously, teaching those academic subjects, whether that be in a school or in a further education college. And then you might have sort of secondary stakeholders, if you like. So it might be parents, carers, um, and research councils, indeed. So we can take some of our learning from this project back to the research councils. And then thinking about how we connect those stakeholders into the different cycle parts of the cycles of research. So that's what we've tried to do. So coming back to our early points about the Concordat, what we're also trying to do is assess excellence in this area. So if we do this kind of well, then we've got some kind of measure for assessing what's worked well and what hasn't. And it's all about this kind of opportunity to share expertise, knowledge and skills. And then how that happens at different points of the process. And ultimately, this maps on to this little schematic that we produced as part of the Public Engagement Research Catalyst. Um, and it's something that we've been discussing today in the meeting I've just come from. It's something I've been discussing with the people on the project for a while now. But this notion of how you plan, something we were discussing with Nick and Hilda this morning about their work on participation now and through creating publics, is about how you um, design and evaluate intent in tension with each other, yeah? So you plan for stuff effectively so you can then assess it at the end of the process. Which for most people is pretty obvious. That's how we do our work. But in this area of engaged research isn't done very often. So thinking about who we're working with, why we're working with them, how we work with them, how they actually interact with us, and then the types of performance that, what do they actually, um, how does it work in terms of performance levels is, is absolutely crucial. And then taking Certainly schools are um, part of that kind of bigger political agenda, both in terms of the wider kind of politics of education, but also in terms of the localised politics of the, um, that particular school. is something you have to take into account. So those dimensions very much apply to what we're trying to do. It is about planning effectively, assessing the process, and thinking about products. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. So at that point, I'll hand over to Gareth. So, um, as you know, I'm the evaluation researcher on the project, and the approach that both of these projects are taking is an action research approach. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but those that aren't, is developed by Kurt Lewin in 1946. And essentially what it's saying is it's not just trying to create knowledge and then just stick, you know, the end goal is creating that knowledge, but also to act on the knowledge that you're creating, on how you might be able to improve on practice and performance. So you start off with a question, and then there's the planning process, which I will talk you through in a minute, the actual planning of these different activities, these, these activities that are being carried out across the SUPI project. And then there's the action. So in this case, it's carrying out this, this public engagement with research activity. And then there's observing. Obviously, that's important for me. Either I'm observing through um, evaluation forms or open-ended uh, questionnaires, or actually mostly semi-structured questionnaires. Um, interviews, I mean, sorry. 
and then there's a reflecting process for actually analyzing the data and then thinking about so what kind of formative insights can we take from that how could we improve the process the uh, functioning of this activity for next time but also what are the summative insights so what value did it have for those that were participating in the activities and how could that be improved next time so it's kind of like a cyclical process each time an activity is carried out rather than just sticking to one particular plan so as Rick has, has touched on it's quite a complex thing to try to engage uh, these 11 different schools with key stages three four and five uh, students across these schools with open university research so you've obviously got the research right across the different faculties and all of the research projects that are being carried out are at obviously at different stages of their research so that can be complex as well they're not all at the end so the types of activities will vary with regards to what which one's going to be suitable with regards to engaging the young people with that research and how we're approaching that is using this flexible but adaptable framework of four types of activities and that's what you're seeing here so the open lectures is something you would have come across very much like what we're doing now one way dissemination of information um, but the picture that you see here is of our annual lecture so we also do uh, we also assess stem lectures that are carried out at Denby through the year but this is the annual lecture and as I said, the challenge is that it can be just the researcher talking to the audience and there's not much engagement with regards to getting feedback from the audience. So how we try to mix this up, as it were, we have four different types of talks across the annual lecture, so four TED-style talks. That gives them the students a chance to see a range of research that are carried out at the Open University. And the, I should say the focus here was on science, but going forward, uh, for the next year we would try to focus on other areas of research and not just on science. Then the other um, type of activity down here is the open dialogues and this is built on the well this the picture that you're seeing here is, is of a research cafe which is built on the model of a cafe scientifique of one of the founders who we have here sitting in the audience <laughs> Dr. Anne Grand um, and basically it's about giving creating an environment where the young people can engage in, in dialogue with the researcher about say the ethical implications or social economic is issues related to that research so it can be useful for the researcher as well to get the insights and what kind of um, what kind of issues are raised by the students as they're discussing that issue and I'll and then there's the open inquiry type activity so this is very much a problem solving type activity so you give them an open question and you ask them to try to solve the problem um, and the picture of what you're seeing here is of a water rocket competition now this is an engagement with a ongoing research project per se but it's allowing the young people to engage with an activity where they learn problem solving skills which are essential to carrying out research in a university setting and that one's going to be carried out another one's going to be carried out last year and it's going to be another one's going to be carried out tomorrow and then the, the activity that you see at the bottom here which is the open creativity work package where it's very much about empowering the young people and giving them the skills and environment where they can actually feed back to us what they think about a particular issue so with the media training activity you have 10 six formers and they come to the open university and they take part in this media training program and then through that then they get a chance to create videos now, as I will explain to you as we go on, I mean, we try to focus that on open university research and particularly strategic areas of open uni university research. So that just gives you a quick overview of the four types of activities. What I'm going to do now is just talk you through um, the events that are carried out across, the, so the reality of this stage. This is kind of like the planning stage within the action research approach. So this is the timeline of um, events that are carried out across our Christmas lecture so the second one will be this year uh, so it starts off with planning meetings now all of them start off with lots of planning meetings because they're not these aren't these aren't easy to set up and run you have to get buy-in from the schools and you have to get buy-in from the researchers at the at here at the Open University and we have to try to find a suitable topic and a suitable time because especially with Christmas lectures the challenge is that lots of the faculties across the university are carrying out Christmas lectures so it's a big ask for these schools to take part in it because obviously they've got limited time within their curriculum and which they can 
leave school and come to these kind of lectures. And then there's the dry run, so we're very much hands-on. We try to help the, the researchers you know, practice their presentation, make sure that they're really both gelling with each, all gelling with each other so that there's a, a clear line through it. So as I sort of um, referred to before was that it's, the Christmas lectures is carried out with four TED-style TED talks. So it's like 10 minutes from each talk. And this is from the science faculty. And so the first talk was about geology and it's sweat, mud and leeches. Uh, so talking about her research that was carried out. And then it, the next one was about astrophysics, so ex, exoplanets and how do you find them. Uh, Professor Andrew Norton was that. And then uh, environmental research project which was uh, carried out by a PhD student and showing the research that he'd carried out over the time of his PhD. And he says the past is the key to the future. And then an eye spot, uh, your place to share nature. So this is very much a citizen science research project. So these range of projects give you, give the, gave the young people an opportunity to see the range of research that are carried out within this faculty. But also it gives them an opportunity to see the, the range of career stages. So you've got all the way from the professors to the senior lecturers to the, to the PhD students. And the young people, you know, from the evaluation were able to see that, you know, they quite enjoyed that to see how, um, how engaging that was for them. And then to try to mix it up at the end, there's a question and answer session. So rather than just trying to make it all about dissemination of information, trying to actually get some feedback from them. You know, what did they think about the lectures? actually at the time and then after that there's once the lecture's been finished there's a little break in the timeline there just showing you that it's not all on, done on the same day and that's basically saying that we asked them to write some blog posts about their experience okay and then the research cafes um, so these research cafes are absolutely great when they work and they really are um, because you really get the chance for the young people to really give their opinion and, and to discuss these, the ethical implications around the research, for example. But actually in practice, trying to get them to work, you have to, it depends on getting the right environment. Um, take, take getting the researcher to understand what kind of questions they can ask so they won't be very closed questions, you know. So questions that will open up an open dialogue about the issues around that issue. And that's not so easy. So we, we, have, we are lucky enough to have Anne here who does that and has a talk with the researchers and tries to brief them on, on how they're going to do that. And then there's also the briefing of the students. So we try to give the power over to the students with regards to playing a role of setting up these activities and running the activities. So try to give them those kind of skills as well rather than just not just about um, listening to the research and, and debating it. And then there's the cafe itself. So how that kind of runs out is that you have an opening statement, just trying to set the scene that this is a relaxed, informal setting. Um, and then that's followed by a brief introduction by the researcher. But what, there's kind of a few rules around that with regards to you're not allowed to have a presentation, no PowerPoint slides. It has to be just a verbal uh, introduction for no longer than five minutes. So that's quite a challenge sometimes. And then there to raise a number of issues that they think that the students should talk about. Obviously the students can come up with other issues if they think that are, are of interest. And as they go off and, they, and they're talking amongst their tables, as it's kind of like a cafe type environment, the researcher will kind of circulate and try to listen in and try to understand what are the big issues that are coming out, any controversial issues, what are the big discussions about. So, and then they, they have to use that as an opportunity to then bring it all together at the end and have a group discussion. So that's kind of the dialogue that goes on. And then the inquiry type activity, here's a timeline. Again, um, like I told you, this is the water rocket competition. So we have schools from different schools across the uh, Denby Teaching School Alliance. So there's 11 schools in total, and we invite them all to come along and to take part in this competition. Um, we did this last year, so, this, so tomorrow we'll be carrying out the second one. The first, last year, we had the rules of trying to fire the rocket as far as you possibly could. Seems like a great rule. And also, to, if you could sa land an egg safely. Now, the young people were clever enough to work out that actually the rules didn't specify where that egg had to land. So they just positioned the egg on the rocket, it took off, and it fell off as soon as it left the launcher, and the rocket kept on going. 
<laughs> wasn't quite what we wanted them to do because we wanted them to go through this process of research, you know, have a hypothesis, collect data, reassess what their hypothesis, whether it worked or not, and then maybe make some changes to the design of their, of their rocket or cha changes to the inclination of the launch pad to try to change how uh, the outcome might be. So we're mixing that up a little bit this, this year. And what we've done is we've got the first session where we're asking them to do distance. They'll be expecting that and I'm sure they can be prepared when they turn up to do that. But the second one, the second session is asking them f to fire a, rock a rocket with accuracy. So after the first session, we'll be able to assess the data, how far were they able to fire the rocket, whether it's a short distance or a long distance, and then try to position that target in a reasonable, uh, fair place in between all of this, uh, the ranges in which they've done, and then try to get them to actually hit the target, okay? So that will be a challenge for them. And then there, uh, the competition itself, I, I believe they, they will fire off two more rockets and then they will have to come up and explain, you know, what, it, what was it they did to change the design of their rocket. So they're going through this kind of thought process of a problem solving activity, trying to solve the problem, okay? And it's very much a challenge for them because it's, uh, they have to do it on the spot, on the day. So the final activity, um, just of the timeline with regards to the planning of these activities, is the media training workshops, okay? So we've done our fifth workshop to date, and we have another two workshops in the autumn. Um, so what these workshops do, again, start off with lots of planning meetings and briefing sessions that we use as an opportunity to give out consent forms and collect evaluation forms, but I will explain that more in detail later. But the actual media training program itself is a five-day training program where they come here to the Open University and work with Open University BAFTA award-winning media professionals. So these are, you know, these are real professionals that have worked in professional settings. So it's a real opportunity for these six formers, who are media, media students, I should say. You know, so they do have a lot of these skills already, and some of them have YouTube accounts with lots of followers because they're always creating videos. So it's not like they're learning from, a, learning from scratch. However, they've never been, or most of them, we assume, have not been in a professional setting and play these types of roles. So there's lots of roles in a, in a film, se um, in a professional setting, such as camera spotting, which I didn't know existed, someone holding the cameraman and walking along behind them so that they walk smoothly. <laughs> didn't know that existed, but the, there's also the cameraman, and then there's the presenter, and then there's all of these kind of different roles that they get to play. So when they first turn up to the media training, they get to practice all these different roles. They get to be interviewed and they also get to interview. So they get to feel what it's like on both sides. And then they get split off into two different groups. And they get the challenge of creating videos around a particular area of research. Now this year we're focusing on the strategic areas of research for the Open University. So that's valuable for the Open University. Um, and then when they've created these videos, so they also, they create the videos, but they actually storyboard the videos and they try to create a, a storyline through it all. So it's very much their input to it. It's not just, they're not actually being told, you know, this is exactly how you have to do it. You know, so we're giving them the, the, the skills and the, and the equipment they need to do that. And then once they've done that, they come back into the, um, they come back into the, the Open University and they do the editing of the films with a professional editor and it teaches them how to do that. So taking all the clips that they've created of the research and bringing it together in a short film. So they learn skills on editing. And then once that five day media training program is over, they, give, they have the opportunity to borrow our kit. So then they can go off and create a film of their, for their fancy, either in the schools or at one of our activities, one of our ac other activities, which is often useful for us because it's kind of a way of capturing some evaluation data by using the student's skills. And so, for example, tomorrow there's the water rocket competition. We hope that uh, we'll have a group of students that will be filming that water rocket competition. So that's an example of that. And then there's the professional editing. I mean, that's not rehashing the videos that they've created. It's very much leaving the videos the way they are, but just top and tailing them, putting the credits on, making sure the names are correct, and making sure that it's a, in a professional enough standard to go up onto the Open University website and also onto the school's websites. And the value for this for the, the students is that they get a chance to be able to refer to these videos in their UCAS application forms, for example, to say, look, this is what, this is a video that I actually took part in, it's a professional video, and I actually 
was involved in creating it. And then the feedback session at the end there is all about the students that carried out the independent filming um, coming back into the Open University or at the school and talking to the Open University media professionals to kind of as a reflection with regards to showing well these are the videos we created when we weren't supervised and was there anything that we missed kind of thing and also an opportunity for the media professionals to see how valuable the training was you know did they learn all of the skills that they needed to learn so that kind of feedback session. So what I'm going to ask you to do now, that was a long talk about the different timelines and events that went across, but the purpose of that, and maybe I should have told you beforehand, was to ask you to talk through the value of these activities. Okay? All right, so I have a few questions for you here on the board, and I'm going to ask you to split off into, I think, two groups. Makes sense. And to try to talk through, first of all, how could you benefit, affect, or change young people by engaging them with research after choosing one of these activities. And I'd like it if you could choose two separate activities. <laughs> um, and then at what stages of the research cycle can you see the value of uh, in-school university engagement? Okay. And then the, the last one, which I'll ask you, which type or types of activities would you use and when? And that's referring to the research cycle that you would take part in. Okay, so I'll hand out these little form, a little form on there, just so you can write down your answers in your, in your group sessions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about lectures and how terrible they are in some ways and how good they are in others. We talked about open inquiries. I didn't hear you say much about open dialogues or open creativity, but that's fine. Um, I'd just like you to do a little task. Okay, so either as a group you can decide. I think that's probably the easiest. But if you if you disagree, I have more of these. <laughs> okay, <laughs> more of these symbols. So this symbol represents open creativity. Okay, because it's all spiky and like a star. <laughs> this one's square, so it's an open lecture. <laughs> and then the round one is an open dialogue. And the one that I didn't pick up, is the open inquiry, which is a triangle. Okay? And here, on this flip chart, what we have is a, is a graph, and on the x-axis we have the stages of the research cycle. Now, I've kind of left that open to you, so we don't have a debate about what the different <laughs> stages are, but I, I can, one I can put my, my screen on the, on the slide in a minute to help you with that. And then on the y-axis here, we have the the scale of impact. And the way I've defined that is primary, secondary, and tertiary. Okay? So, so primary, secondary, and tertiary, as in the impact on the young people. Is it going to impact the people that are participating directly? Or secondary, is it going to impact, help me out, Rick, <laughs> the teachers around them that are also interacting, but they're not the main focus of it? Or is it going to influence their, their parents when they go home? and have a wider tertiary impact on, say, their social behaviour, for example, maybe, depending on the impact. Okay, so do you want to just have a quick discussion amongst yourself about where they go? Okay. I'll give okay. you... I'll you give you the start and end of the research Oh, yes, sorry, that's a good point. That is a good point. So I'm going to show you on the screen here the schematic. Now... I will go into the explanation of why the research cycle is going the opposite way and the theory, the theory behind it, but I won't go into the depths of the theory at the moment because that's the theoretical framework which I will explain in a little while. But basically, the point here is, is when you start off a research on the research cycle, you're trying to conceive of a research question. And Liz um, made mention to the fact that's a very difficult thing to do because it's trying to understand all of the different issues that you might take into account. So your knowledge of the issue you're trying to research or the problem you're trying to address is quite widely bounded. Yeah? And as you move along the research cycle towards actually finding a conclusion and analysing the data and determining the, the significance to the extent to which you met your objectives and therefore how much you are able to achieve your aim, your knowledge of your issue has become more bounded, okay? And less uncertain, okay? So that's why the research cycle starts off here, 
at the beginning of the research cycle, and it moves along the schematic to the end, at a point at the end, where you've actually found something out. So this arrow is going this way, but the research cycle starts here, because <laughs> this arrow represents uncertainty or how much you actually know about the issue. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> okay, I will give you, I kind of anticipated this, so I drew this diagram behind. Okay, and what this is based on, okay, is Funtowicz and Ravet's typology of knowledge that characterizes a system. And the, way, the reason why Funtowicz and Ravet has done this is because he wants to show what types of problem solving strategies might you use across a system. Okay? So the question is, first of all, is a system. How much system uncertainty? So how much uncertainty is characterised in the system you're trying to address? Okay? So it increases with uncertainty this way. On the y-axis you have decision stakes, which essentially is values. <coughs> right? So how compatible are those values? At the bottom you may have very one-way values. There's no, there's, no distinguish, there's no argument about the values associated with the research project okay? and the outcome and the reason why you're doing it. As you go up this, the problem that you're trying to address, it requires taking account of a diversity of values that aren't necessarily compatible and never will be compatible and in fact never should be compatible because you're dealing with very complex issues. Okay? So for example, um, the world that I used to come from, which is the risk world and environment, up here you'd have a policy maker, a policy decision, sorry. So the knowledge characterising that decision is is you have to take account of everybody's values across that society. Yeah? So they, they are naturally divergent. The information that you have about the issue, so you mentioned something there before about not knowing the, the outcome and not really knowing what the answer, and even when you get the answer, whether it's the right answer. So these are kind of like the unknown unknowns towards the extreme end. So when you draw these two together, this is the type of knowledge that's characterising your problem. As you move down towards down here, and I can't remember the name of that, which I do now from maths, the little point. Origin. Origin. Oh, is it origin? I thought it was something more complex than that. But there you go. <laughs> okay, so the origin. As you move down towards the origin, your, issue, your knowledge around the problem becomes more bounded. Okay? Because down here you have deterministic knowledge. The knowledge exists, so you might say, why would you carry out the research? Well, you don't have it at the moment. But you know you can go out there and you can collect it. Okay? So, on that basis, so for example, that's a, they've said that the types of problem solving strategies you need down here are applied science. These are professional consultancy because you need a, a measure of subject values, judgments to be made with regards to the sufficiency of the evidence that you're having a look at in the context of the problem you, you make, you're addressing. Yeah? And then up here, the fact that you are dealing with highly uncertain issues. And sometimes you have to go in opposite directions to get to where you want to get to. But mapping that onto the research cycle, yeah? Okay, so this is why we say, this is why the research cycle goes in the opposite direction, in the sense that when you start your problem and you start to try, you know there's a particular issue, you know there's a gap in knowledge, but you need to address that. So, what are you going to formulate that research question? Yeah? Your understanding of the issue is a lot broader. And it's also important as an opportunity for you then to go out and talk to a greater number of publics, a greater number of values are involved, etc. Okay? Does that all make sense? Okay, great. So here are the different ones. And what I'd like you to do is to, if you disagree, that's fine, because I've got more of these. <laughs> but I'd like you to come and put them on the schematic of where you think they fit with regards to the research cycle when it starts here and ends at the origin and the scale of impact here. So is it having just an impact on the publics that you're actually engaging with or those that are engaged? taking part in the activity that may maybe not necessarily the focus but also the tertiary impact. Let you think about that.
Conceptualizing the problem, yeah. you know, you are. Yeah. Just Depends what thing. you mean by creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean that you <laughs> What's creative to you? Yeah. It's like, what's so new about that to me? You've got to be creative to, to dream up the question in the first place. Yes. Yeah, but, then but you've also got to be creative, creative to dream up the, the process by which you're going to answer yeah. that question. But I was talking to a kid who's STEM. He's aiming to do maths at Cambridge, kind of thing. 15 year old, grade into six. Big smarty pants. Yeah, a big smarty pants on that. But he won't get in front of the video camera. He does not think of himself as creative. But when I started making suggestions about having a storyline and a plot to explain something mathematical, like logs, he went, oh, he said, we can make a pot of it. And we can have a, a wood with, t with, um, <laughs> with logs and a wood cutter. And I go, you're not creative? That, that's a boy who says he's not creative. So where would he be? He'd say, I, yeah, I don't do this. Okay. Yeah. So when you say, Creativity, what's creative to you is not to me. Oh, yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. great. This is such a nebulous concept. That should be a star, it should be a cloud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to argue, Liz, but just because time's running out, but I'll argue you the offers. <laughs> where would you want the Where do you want the open dialogues? Or between the star. Between the star? Somewhere there. Somewhere there. And do you want it up or down? Up, 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 all the way to secondary, all the way to tertiary. 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 Okay. And did you and did you take that into account here with regards to secondary yeah. tertiary? Yeah. And you took that into account here. Brilliant. Excellent. Okay. So I'm going to move on swiftly. <laughs> I wouldn't. There's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you my answer. <laughs> yes. That's just what you were saying before. We might as well be in secondary. So I'm going to have to whiz through this and you're going to have to forgive me for whizzing through this because the time to finish is in five minutes time. Is that right? Quarter two, yeah? We must stick to time. So um, this is the theoretical framework in which I'm coming up with. Now the reason behind this is just give you a bit of a rationale. So I've already talked you through the Funtowicz and Ravetz typology of knowledge and across a system and for, for determining what kind of strategies might be useful. T determined by the problem you're trying to address. Um, now, when I'm carrying out evaluation uh, or facilitating evaluation across the Open University with researchers, one of the issues they have is that they won't necessarily have ever used questionnaires. They won't have used kind of these tools that you would need to collect the evaluation data. And they won't know when to use them or when to use these different types of activities, for example. Yeah? So, we want them to go through a process of understanding that. I'm just going to hand this out to you. You can look through it. I'm not going to focus too much on it. But the point really here is, is what, you, what I'm handing out to you is the objectives of the Open Creativity Work Package. And one thing I didn't tell you at the beginning was that every type of activity has its own set of aims and objectives. Although you saw them, the broad aims of the project, there are a, a definitive aims and objectives. And what you're looking at in those documents is those objectives broken down into single objectives, i.e. they're not compound objectives. There's a particular type of knowledge that you need to answer, to need, need in order to answer, or to meet rather, those objectives, okay? So it's following that research process. And what I'm suggesting is that if you can determine the type of knowledge that you need in order to meet that objective, that maps on to the the type of activity 
that you should be using or you could use, for example, yeah, to collect that evidence. And then it comes into the evaluation. So what kind of methods are you going to use in order to collect that data? You know which, you know which type of activity you're going to use and what kind of methods you go, are you going to use. Right? And that is determined, the type of method you might use is determined by the availability of the data and on the y-axis here, the range of perspectives. Again, mapping up onto these, these similar axes or the same axes that uh, Funtwix and Ravets used, in principle, the same axes. So, and then the bottom axis here, which is um, to do with the t kind of techniques. So there's a distinction here between methods of data collection, i.e., what are those tools and techniques that you, sorry, not tools, what are those tools you will use to collect the data, but then what are the techniques you will use to analyze the data once you've got it. Okay? And the suggestion here is at the end is that on the y-axis you have location of uncertainty. Where is that uncertainty? Is it located with the data, the raw data? Is it simulation that you're talking about and you've got an issue with the data itself? Or is it with the range of people that you need to go out and talk to, the actual decision, um, the brokering process? And then there's the level of uncertainty along this edge here. So how much understanding do you have about the problem? Okay? So that's really about it. So it's, it's understanding the types of knowledge that characterise your objectives. Number two, the affordance of the activities. So what, how much do they afford you with regards to understanding the, the impact and at what different stage, stages of the research cycle you should, you should use them. And then the affordance of the research methods and then the affordance of the research techniques. Now I know I've rushed through that and I am completely open to comments and feedback from this and I hope that we'll be able to engage with this kind of uh, theoretical framework and talk more about it. But because of time, I'm going to move on quickly and just give you an example of the media training activity that was carried out. And well, first of all, the reason why it was carried out. Rick really should be doing this one, but I'm going to take you through it. Um, so this is a theoretical framework, basically the science education approach. So this is all about the education <coughs> for citizenship. For citizenship, yeah? So it's empowering these young people as citizens, okay? Going beyond the, um, beyond just rolling out activities, but actually, so, so, for example, sorry. So, the science education can be all about getting young people to take up science subjects, all about getting them to come into university, okay? But going beyond that, actually empowering them with the kind of skills that they can use to be effective citizens, whether that means they go on to to go on to make the transition to university or not, okay? You're still giving them those kind of skills that they can use going out into their professional career otherwise. And then there's a social, that ties into the social cultural approach, so learning outside of the classroom in the informal setting, for example. And then working with smaller groups, i.e. in schools usually are dealing with 30 students in one particular group. But this is more about you know, smaller groups. So the media training activity is about 10 students. So it's more intense and more um, personal contact they're having with the uh, media professionals and the researchers that they're working with. And in collaboration and cooperation. So they're, co they're collaborating together. The students are being encouraged to, to work together to be able to create these films. So they're gaining kind of team working skills, leadership skills, those kind of skills. And then the creative. It's a creative process, okay? So giving them those kind of skills so they can respond to media messages that they're receiving, right? Although I should say that a lot of these students, they are already very competent when it comes to media literacy and the kind of skills they have. Like I said, they already have their YouTube accounts with lots of followers and they're creating videos all the time. But we can add to that by giving them, uh, bringing them into an authentic setting i.e. authentic setting in the workplace and giving them those, those kind of skills that they need and an experience of actually working with a professional film crew. You know, so they can also have that on the CV, but they also have, builds them confidence to know that when they actually go out there, they can, they can do this. You know, they, they've tried it, they've done it. And then the communication and engagement angle. So this is all about um, media literacy, the ability to access and understand and create. So I kind of referred to that, but it's... Um, Get, like I said, you know, these students, they do know a lot about this already. They do have the skills in place they, to create professional videos. But it's really making sure that empowering them to be able to do that, to be able to respond to media messages. And then valuing forms of expertise. 
Um, yeah, so understanding, making sure that they create these videos in such a way that they're, they're trying to represent different people's perspectives. So the different students or the teachers or the researchers' perspectives. It's not all just about them, but understanding that kind of professional um, way of working. And then issues of gender and inclusivity. Um, this has come out of the work from Invisible Witness. Is that correct, Rick? Yeah. So that's about understanding um, the young people's perspective of scientists, for example, and allowing them to have a voice to say what it is, that, how it is that they see scientists. Is it the way they, we stereotypically say they see scientists or not? So this is the timeline of events that you've already seen. However, in green, what you see is the different points at which I've carried out evaluation. Okay? And the whole point of this approach towards evaluation is, yes, you know, it's the action research approach, so it's the planning. And the planning stage is very important because you have a name of objectives for the research. Sorry about that. <laughs> Obviously, very important person. <laughs> um, uh, so, you, so it's taking every opportunity you can take, basically, to collect this evaluation. Now, if you ask them always to sit down at every point you interacted with them and fill out an evaluation form, that might be interesting to me, but realistically, it's not sustainable going forward. So really, what, what I, the advice that I have for anybody trying to carry out evaluation of public engagement with research activities is to map it out like this on a timeline. Have a look at the opportunities that you have, you know, the kind of actions that you're going to be carrying out anyway. For example, the planning meetings, they have to happen, you know, where you can collect field notes during those planning meetings, you know, you can try and understand what are the impacts, what, you know, so what are the dynamics of that partnership and what makes it work and what, what's not making it work, for example. And then the briefing session, okay, we have to brief the students about it, but it's also an opportunity to ask them to carry out a, a pre-evaluation form. It's also a perfect time to do it because they haven't actually taken part in the activity before. And then the actual media training is a star amongst the evaluation of these activities because the students are actually creating films. And whilst they're creating these films, they have to learn how to carry out interviews. So they're actually doing a lot of the evaluation for me. You know? Of course, then it raises the question of evaluating them in terms of the video footage. And then the others are kind of self-explanatory. Video footage of the um, independent filming and interviews at the end with the researchers and the teachers, trying to get their perspective. Did they, was there some surprises in there for them? And these are kind of the aims of the project, of the actual uh, media training thing. So very kind of nothing um, untowards there, th things that you will have recognised before, as you can imagine, kind of confidence in front of the camera and behind the camera and carrying out these kind of roles. So this is quickly the evaluation findings. Essentially, what I can tell you from the, pre from the initial analysis is that having art Having the opportunity to be able to ask the students before they take part in the activity, so this is the kind of skills they hoped for, and then the skills that they've gained, so asking them in the, in the post-evaluation form at the end of their five-day training programme, and also in a 360 evaluation uh, point at the end of the five-day programme, and then the skills they use during the independent filming of, their, of these films that they created. And that points towards kind of core skills that are coming out of this. So these are kind of confidence in front of the camera. These were very much here that they were mentioning them, you know. But then it's also uh, technical skills about how to edit. You know, they found that amazingly uh, great and it really helped them in their media studies. That was skills gained very much so. But then the skills used was all to do with kind of leadership skills. When they actually had to go off on themselves, but it's, when it wasn't supervised, they had to use leadership skills and those kind of team building skills. So that finishes it. I know we don't have time for these questions. <laughs> so this is appeal to everyone who's listening on camera as well. <laughs> but this is the kind of things that we would like to, to hear from you about. You know, these are the kind of questions we'd it's like to hear. It's probably worth this point saying, Gareth, that you will be blogging about this. And this yes. will be embedded, this, the video of this presentation will be embedded in the blog. So if anybody does have a question, they can comment via the blog. Yes. Or and I hope the camera is on Anne right now, because that's, <laughs> that's exactly true, yes. There isn't a Twitter tag for it. Uh, not, uh, there is a Twitter tag for the project, I believe. Is it? I haven't no, used Twitter. Have Twitter no. uh, sorry, no, we do have, uh, sorry, we have a tag here, which is hashtag soupy. Hashtag soupy, okay. Hashtag what? Soupy, S-U-P-I. So that stands for School University Partnership Initiative, but it's just soupy. Okay.
Yeah, so these are the kind of questions we'd like to raise and hear from you um, going forward. But I'd just like to say thank you for coming. I know that we've just gone over five minutes over time, so I'll end there. Okay? Thank you.